Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 34. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, welcome to our podcast where we explore cutting-edge advancements in the field of neuroscience and neurotechnologies and hear from experts who are pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Douglas Rose, who is a professor emeritus in neurology and former clinical director of MEG and director of MEG Core at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Rose has made groundbreaking contributions to the field of magnetoencephalography and has a wealth of knowledge and expertise to share with us. As a former PhD student and professional with a strong interest in MEG, I'm honored to have Dr. Rose on the show to discuss his fascinating work and share his insights into the exciting world of MEG. So buckle up, grab a notebook, and get ready to learn from the best as we dive into the fascinating world of MEG with Dr. Douglas Rose. Hello, Melania. Hello, Dr. Rose. So wonderful to have you here today on our podcast. It's a great pleasure to be speaking with you today. Well, thank you, Melania, for inviting me. I'm joining from Cincinnati, Ohio. I am retired now, but as you say, I was at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, which is a standalone children's hospital that is academically affiliated with the University of Cincinnati. Perhaps because of the university link, the Children's Hospital has always been oriented toward both basic and clinical research. Yeah, and what reminds me of this hospital the first time when I got there and I was walking through corridors of Cincinnati Children's, I got to know about the polio vaccine and the person who actually introduced it. Maybe you can tell a couple of words about that because I think this is what Cincinnati Children's Hospital is famous for as well. Yeah, so, so that was uh, Dr. Sabin. And he developed an oral vaccine that you could take with a few drops, like on a shorter cube, or just directly into the mouth from an eyedropper. And this was an advance uh, for two reasons. One, the, he was not the first with a vaccine. Dr. Salk was the first with a vaccine. But uh, that was required an injection. The advantage uh, for the polio vaccine with Dr. Sabin was that taken orally, it protected uh, that part of the body where the polio virus attacked in the GI system. In addition, it was very easy to administer. So you could administer it to children, which was a very at-risk population, and you could administer it around the world uh, with just an eyedropper. You didn't need a whole lot of hypodermic needles. Mm, thank you so much. Speaking about children, I want to start with your childhood. <laughs> Who did you want to be when you were growing up? Well, when I was about nine years old, I was given a uh, Walt Disney's book, Our Friend the Atom, and read that, and that was about age nine. And from then until age about 15, my great desire was to become a nuclear physicist. In teenage years, I switched and I became very religious and wanted to become a minister. And then subsequently in college, I switched again and decided that I wanted to become a physician. 
<laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rose. That's such an interesting journey from nuclear physicist to minister and then already a physician and not just a physician within different fields, but particular neurologist and neurophysiologist. So why did you choose this particular field? And can you tell us about your journey into becoming a neurologist and neurophysiologist? Well, thank you for asking me, Yana. So in college, I majored in psychology, and there were two courses in particular that caught my attention and interest. The first was a child cognitive development, where we studied the work of Piaget and other developmental psychologists. And a second was a course in physiologic psychology, where we studied brain anatomy and physiology in great detail. Once I became a doctor, my choice then was pediatrics specializing in neurology. I really wanted to understand the neurophysiologic basis of cognition and children's cognitive development. That goal seems reasonable now in these days, but generally in 1970, that goal was not considered to be possible, and I was actively discouraged by my advisors with whom I spoke with to, to go into that field. Maybe you can give us just a short overview of why at that time this didn't seem feasible to study basis of cognition by using neurophysiological methods. Well, uh, the tools we had were uh, skull film, skull x-rays. There was no CT, no MRI scan. In addition, uh, the understanding of EEG related to psychology was not very much in depth. It showed some physiologic brain activity, but it didn't really reveal brain processes. And the field of psychology was mostly interviewing, watching subjects do different projects. So these three fields were, at that point in time, quite separate and, and distant from each other. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rose. It reminded me of a lecture that I was listening from Dr. Donchin, and he was talking about work potential, studying work potentials at that time, and he mentioned that nobody was believing in long latency evoked responses. People were saying that that's absolute nonsense, that, you know, P300, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's impossible. Right. Do you recall anything like that? Because right now, I think nobody cannot even think that that wasn't feasible or didn't look feasible at that time and how everything changed. Maybe you also can recall some fun things that seems to be funny right now, but at that time, people presumed that that's absolute truth and things that seem possible right now were impossible. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for evoked responses, for instance, in my neurology training, I did not have any exposure to evoked responses. They were doing EMG, which is stimulation of muscles with electrical activity, but it was really kind of the beginning of things like visual evoked responses and auditory evoked responses. And we for auditory evoked responses, there were a lot of hypotheses that got put forward that had to be revised over the years of, of what was happening once they got uh, accepted as, as a, a real uh, brain activity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, then let's get back to your path. <laughs> and the second question that I'm very curious about is, why did you choose this specific specialization in epilepsy, and particularly in pediatric epilepsy? Why did this field interest you? Well, uh, I got involved in, in epilepsy research by chance. Uh, my wife and I moved to Washington, D.C. because my wife had gotten a medical fellowship there at NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health. And the position for me in Washington, D.C. was also at NIH in Roger Porter's epilepsy group. A whole new world opened for me working with a group that specialized just in treating epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And not only you started to specialize in epilepsy and pediatric epilepsy, but you also started to work with magnetoencephalography, MAG. Uh, so 
what prompted you to start specializing in this particular technique? Well, this was kind of serendipity. I was asked to give a research presentation for the NIH Epilepsy Group when I was interviewing for the fellowship. I had already started topographic mapping of scalp EEG potentials when I was at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland. And I had heard about MEG in 1982 as a tool with which one could do intracranial source estimation. Fortunately, the NIH group was interested in MEG also, and they were about to borrow a single channel magnetometer from the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. So th these two events uh, kind of occurred simultaneously. It's so interesting that you are talking now about one channel MEG. With how many channels were you recording brain activity at Cincinnati Children's Hospital? Uh, we had a whole head magnetometer there, 275 channels. Yes, just to showcase to our listeners what dramatic change occurred over the years. And now for those listeners who might not be familiar with MEG, can you explain what is that? What type of imaging technique is magnetoencephalography and how it differs from other neuroimaging techniques? Because in the world of brain-computer interfaces, which we have many listeners from that field, they are most familiar with electroencephalography, EEG. Yes. So uh, EEG, uh, which as you say is, is uh, more familiar to most uh, listeners, a scalp EEG recorded on the scalp, measures the electrical currents generated by nerve cells in the brain. While MEG, magnetoencephalography by contrast, records the magnetic fields generated by the electrical currents from those same nerve cells in the brain. So MEG is similar to EEG in that both measure brain nerve cell activity and both can record very rapid changes in brain activity, which occur many times in less than a second. On the other hand, modalities such as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, records brain anatomy, and fMRI, functional MRI, measures changes in blood oxygen level and averages those changes over one to several seconds. PET, PET, positron emission tomography, averages brain activity over many minutes. SPECT, which is single photon emission computed tomography, also averages brain flow over many minutes. NIRS, near-infrared spectroscopy, and FNRIS, functional near-infrared spectroscopy, record oxygen changes in blood circulation in skin and brain cortex just below the skull, although it can do so fairly quickly. Since brain processes begin, evolve, and can complete in less than a second, the very fast time resolution of both EEG and MEG can capture and describe those brain processes, which the other neuroimaging techniques blur because of their slow time resolution or limited depth penetration, as in the case of near-infrared spectroscopy. Then the question becomes, where within the brain are those processes occurring? Yes, that's a good question. And probably this is where some of MEG advantages are. So can you tell more about the advantages and some disadvantages of <laughs> MEG compared with the EEG? Yeah, well, when MEG first came out, it became clear that one advantage was for MEG was that it was quite straightforward to make an estimation of where in the brain the nerve cell signals were occurring that we were recording what we call intracranial sources. The disadvantage of MEG compared to EEG is that MEG must be recorded in a shielded room to reduce magnetic noise caused by hospital equipment. And the subject must lie very still or be asleep during the recording. And currently, MEG has been very, very expensive to purchase and to operate. 
And we will be talking a little bit more as we go further in our conversation about some changes that are happening with MEG and maybe those obstacles will not be obstacles anymore in the future, but we'll get to that point. So I still have this question and I'm still thinking about it. The first time I heard it in a, a conversation in a lecture of Dr. Papanikolo, where he started his presentation with a question, is MEG an art or a science? So I'm very curious how you would answer this question. So we were working on clinical applications, and in our experience, it's both. MEG was an art in trying to learn how to record specific patients uh, for their medical problems. We had to devise and, and understand what the problem was the patient had. And then it was kind of an art of how to capture that uh, information from the patient. On the other hand, once we had recorded, in my case, epileptiform spikes, discharge, electrical discharges associated with epilepsy, how to localize those in the brains was very much dependent on basic physics principles and on very careful mathematical modeling of the brain and of the head. So in that aspect, MEG was also a science, depending on mathematics and physics. So it's both. Yes, it's both. Yes, I would like to ask you to tell listeners just a little bit about the complexity. Even mathematical modeling, it might seem to be easy to the listeners as you described it, but it's not as such a straightforward process. Yes, because we can have infinite amount of sources in general in the brain that we are trying to showcase, but there are some limitations. There are different models that we can use. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Yes. So uh, the physicists that I worked with, and if there are any physicists listening, you'll understand this, described it as an ill-posed problem, because as you point out, there are many, many possibilities of source localization. So one has to use certain principles to simplify how to look at it and how you simplify it and what kinds of models you use for localization can change where, where you think the source is coming from, which is important. When we started out, we used very, very simple basic modeling. As we developed clinical expertise, we developed or actually adopted five or six different models of where to localize. A little bit like the weather map says, well, if we use this map, it's going to rain tomorrow uh, in the morning. If we use this map, it's going to rain in the afternoon. But we use these different models, and they approach the problem differently. If they predict the same location in the brain, then we have a pretty good comfort that maybe that actually is the location. But if they indicate very different locations in the brain, then we're very cautious in interpreting the information clinically uh, because it, it may be a much more complex mix or collaboration or interaction of abnormal brain regions in epilepsy causing the seizures. So that indicates to us to use caution. So yes, it is uh, complicated. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rose. As you started talking now about the estimation of sources and clinically and in epilepsy, my next question is about your pioneering work of using MEG for epilepsy diagnosis and spike detection. Can you tell us more about this area of research and how it all started? Well, it started in physics laboratories, and then uh, David Cohen, who is sometimes called the father of MEG, uh, in 1972 at MIT, published an article on the MEG recording of alpha brainwave activity with a very sensitive, it's called superconducting quantum interference device. And if you take the first letter of each, um, it uh, spells squid a squid detector. 
And he could, uh, it was expensive and difficult to make. It had to be cooled with liquid helium. So he had just a single channel. That's how it started, with a single channel magnetometer for human recordings. And around that time, he also published an MHA recording of what looked like part of a Patty Mall seizure, just a few seconds of it, in an epilepsy patient. Quite a bit later, around 1982, Dan Barth, Bill Sutherling, and several others uh, working together as a team in UCLA published an article on recording very frequent identical epileptiform spikes in a patient with benign Rolandic epilepsy. And the authors included source localization of the spikes in the reports. It's a very interesting uh, report to read. In 1983, Susumo Sato, whose, whose uh, laboratory I joined at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, began looking for electromagnetic spikes with a single channel axial gradiometer in a different population of epilepsy patients. Adults with temporal lobe epilepsy who were scheduled to have epilepsy surgery to remove the small part of the brain causing the seizures. These patients were going to have to have surgery, so they were very different from the uh, Barth and Sutherland patients with benign epilepsy who were not going to have surgery because most of those patients will outgrow their epilepsy. So we were looking at a pre-surgical population. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, especially for those who might not be familiar with a neural basis of epilepsy. For those people, can you give just a very brief explanation why are we interested in looking at the brain activity in patients who are suffering from epilepsy? Well, there are many kinds of epilepsy. I described two. Uh, some forms of epilepsy involve the whole brain, and for those patients, medication is generally the best solution. But some patients, there's just one small part of the brain that causes a seizure, but that seizure might occur once a week, several times a week, multiple times a day, and it totally interrupts activity, but it's just one small part of the brain, and the rest of the brain is working normally. So if we could find and locate that one small part of the brain, the neurosurgeon has skills to go in, do a neurosurgical procedure to find where that location is that we've pinpointed and remove that small part of the brain that's causing the seizures. And then the patient in, in our experience remains the same afterwards in their intellectual abilities and movement, hand movement, walking and all, talking, but they stop having seizures. So this could be a cure uh, for their epilepsy. So for those patients, the epilepsy surgery and MEG became very important. Mm -hmm. And how we got to that point, we will learn as we go further in our conversation. You mentioned the laboratory of Susumo Sato at NIH. So can you tell us about your experience as a fellow working at that lab and the development of the technique to record temporal lobe epileptiform spikes using that single channel magnetometer? which I think was borrowed from the Naval Research Laboratory. Yes, there weren't many, many magnetometers in those days, uh, and the Naval Research Laboratory was very kind to loan it to Dr. Sato. When I joined Dr. Sato in his lab, there were no published reports recording the infrequent and variable types of epileptiform spikes that occur in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, the patients we wanted to study. And there were no previous articles describing the methodology that would be needed. That is, there was no instruction manual. We had to discover the specific techniques needed ourselves. The task seemed initially impossible. For unilateral temporal lobe epilepsy, that is seizures occurring from one side of the brain, we needed to map the magnetic fields at about 40, 50 locations over one side of the head to capture the two magnetic extrema, as they're called, showing the magnetic field, and the many null locations, that is, where nothing was happening, in between those uh, magnetic extrema. Dr. Sato 
uh, by the time I had gotten there, had already designed and had built for him a wooden gantry to hold the large magnetometer. It was, it was um, probably three feet long and maybe 15 inches across, you know, a big cylinder. And he had designed recording caps for each patient. He actually took Speedo swimming caps and uh, drew grids on them, marking uh, where we would do recordings. Also, because the single-channel magnetometer recorded over such a small location of the person's head, this wasn't, wasn't a whole head coverage, we always had to simultaneously record the, the standard 21-channel scalp EEG to identify when a spike had or had not occurred, because sometimes we might be recording with the magnetometer over a place where there's going to be no magnetic fields, and we wouldn't know that unless we saw the spikes on the EEG. Since a patient with temporal lobe epilepsy can have multiple kinds of spikes, unlike the patient with benign Merlandic epilepsy, we had to develop a method of spike typing so that we could make coherent magnetic field maps, each from a single type of the patient's spikes. Then, after we did all that, we had to determine, actually just predict, the intracranial location of the sources from the magnetic field maps and compare the predictions to the patient's post-surgical results. For the first successful recording, we recorded one patient every afternoon for 30 months. And then we said, Dr. Sato and I said, well, we probably have enough data. So we sat down and started analyzing it. Subsequently, we learned how to map the magnetic field more rapidly, but with a single channel magnetometer, this still took us about two weeks recording every afternoon. Yeah, that's unbelievable how long it took to record this brain activity. But what I found very interesting from what you said, that already at that time, the recording were made simultaneously with electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography, which is still the case to this day. <laughs> so how would you explain that? And at that time, when there was a real necessity to see where the spikes are, the EEG was used as a complementary modality, and we're doing the same right now as well. So what's the reason behind it? So yes, so, so first off, most of the people doing MEG recordings for epilepsy are neurologists. And part of neurologist basic training is an EEG. So to start with, all of the neurologists have a familiarity with EEG. Uh, but EEG, the way it's set up, is fairly easy to very quickly look at one page of data and see what's happening all over the brain. We might not know where it's coming from, but we can see it all over the brain. A whole head magnetometer, although that sounds really good, it's really 275 single channel magnetometers. And so if you look at a full page of 275 channels of MEG recording, mm, you could see if there is a spike, but you have no idea where it's coming from. Also, things that are very easy to see in EEG and familiar, such as a person falling asleep or waking up or movement artifacts, are very easy to detect in EEG while they have a more complicated appearance in MEG. MEG is very complicated to read while we're actually doing the recording. It's very, very useful at the next step when we're looking at epileptiform discharges, which indicate where the seizures may be coming from and localize those in the brain. So yes, that's why uh, most Neurologic centers that are doing MEG continue to record EEG. There is also an interest in combining the findings from EEG and MEG, but not as much work has been done with that. Uh, that's a whole separate topic that maybe somebody else who who specializes in that uh, would be interested in talking about with you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Another question. 
is the time that we spend of doing MEG recording in a single patient significantly decreased. Can you just provide an estimate how it changed when you were working with a single patient for three months of a person continuously coming to the lab and now doing the evaluation for, let's say, epilepsy surgery? So the difference now with a whole head magnetometer is that we do recording in about an hour and a half compared to two weeks. But this is not an identical recording. We're recording so much more in an hour and a half. We're recording evoked responses, recording awake and asleep and comparing those. We're doing a low frequency and a higher frequency recordings. So we're doing a much more thorough and much more careful recordings and include, in addition to which, we're recording, I talked about two magnetic extrema, we're recording both magnetic extrema at the same time. So it's a much more detailed and we get much more information from this recording at an hour and a half. To do a similar recording identical to uh, what we recorded over two weeks now with a whole head magnetometer, we could probably do in about five or 10 minutes by comparison. <laughs> so, the, so the hour and a half, you just understand we're doing many, many more tasks of recording than we could even possibly begin to do uh, back in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah, that's amazing, the change that occurred over time. While you were talking, I also got very curious about the type of epilepsy you started looking at. So why specifically you decide to focus on temporal lobe epilepsy? Was this a particular, is, is this a particular type of epilepsy that is more important for one or another reason, or maybe application of MEG was more supportive of investigating this type of epilepsy? Can you tell a little bit more about this? Well, well of course, I'm a pediatric neurologist. I was the only pediatric neurologist uh, during my time uh, there doing the um, MEG recording when I was working with Dr. Sato subsequently in the uh, epilepsy group. Most of the neurologists were adult neurologists. The epilepsies in adults and pediatrics differ somewhat. The adult epilepsy, more frequently, adults have seizures that start in the temporal lobes. Uh, there's regions in the, in the brain and the hippocampus uh, that's deep on the inner edge of the temporal lobes at the base of the brain that is close to the bones in the brain. And you have head trauma or other kinds of events, some uh, kinds of viral infections. That affects the hippocampus in the temporal lobe, causing temporal lobe epilepsy. So most of the patients we were seeing at NIH were adult, the adult population, because it's a research institute, and participants had to be able to give permission to be studied. And so that meant uh, mostly we were studying adults. We had a few pediatric patients that were considered a pediatric patients by the adult neurologists. They were like down to 12 years of age, not what a pediatric neurologist necessarily considers as the, as the time range from newborns to say 18. So that was the kind of patient. And, and also mostly temporal lobe epilepsy occurred on, on one side, not always, sometimes both but occurs on one side so that it's amenable to surgical resection in different locations. Uh, the hippocampus is, stretches uh, for some distance. And so you have to figure out uh, whether it's deep in the brain, the hippocampus, the temporal lobe, or maybe farther out on the surface. So these were kinds of issues of localization. And the, the patient population lent itself well to MEG validation studies of the technique which is why the pediatric patients, seizures can start almost anywhere focally. So again, MEG turns out to be very, very important in pediatric epilepsies. Yeah, thank you so much. This also brought to my memory radial versus tangentially oriented sources. If we have temporal lobe epilepsy, in these terms, is it also more suitable for using MEG? in this case, in terms of the localization of the sources themselves. Right. 
So when we talk about sources, that's a little more complicated, a little bit beyond uh, perhaps the, the scope of this podcast. But it has to do with the orientation of the brain cells and whether they are oriented radially out, as it were, from the center of the brain or parallels to, say, the surface of the skull, which would be called, we call them tangential. Uh, MEG uh, actually doesn't see the ones that are radial to the, uh, that is uh, pointed out from the center out to the surface. It only sees the ones that are tangential. And that's a separate issue, which is why some people would like to or it would do source localization combining MEG and EEG, which we touched on earlier, uh, that perhaps another speaker would pr talk about. But it turns out, fortunately, for our purposes, the brain is very convoluted. There are many folds in the cortex of the brain. And so in epilepsy, the, the seizures and epileptic form discharge tend to spread over a region of the cortex. So almost always, there's some part of the brain that the nerve cells are oriented tangentially to the surface and are detected by MEG. But it is a very, very interesting topic, topic very technical. If you get into MEG, it it's, uh, becomes a, the actual recording and interpretation. It becomes a, a more important issue. And particularly if you're doing like evoke responses, they may not have the same kind of spread over the convolution the way epilepsy does. So you have to be very careful and know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Getting back to your career development, how did experience in Dr. Sato's lab shape your later research and publications in the field of MEG? Well, we didn't have any reference articles that we could refer to for methodology in related fields or particularly in the epilepsy, which we had to work in. So we it was very much uh, every every task we undertook was a was an innovation to solve the issues. So I think one of the things that it taught me to do was when I was faced with a problem I couldn't solve was to try to innovate how the solution could be reached. And it also the experience uh, taught me not to be daunted by research goals that initially seemed impossible. A lot of the articles that we published, uh, I guess this. Yeah, and this is uh, probably the case in many new fields, were related initially to the technology and developing the technology and techniques. So I guess we had a hand in writing the, the methodology articles that uh, weren't available to us. Uh, and this kind of conditioned me, as it were, to any new field to, to realize that I wouldn't have all the answers, but it was possible if I paid attention and was persistent uh, to come up with solutions to the problems and methodologies would provide answers. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, thank you, because this is absolutely in line with our podcast, Neuro Careers, doing the impossible, how to do the impossible. So that's already an answer. After working at the Dr. Sato's lab, you went to work to the MEG Research Center at the Albuquerque a VA Medical Center. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about that part of your career? Sure. So I had done uh, two years of uh, epilepsy and EEG fellowship as a neurologist. And then I had done four years additional of MEG research uh, at the NIH. At that time, uh, a substantial background in MEG. So I was invited to interview and, and subsequently uh, accepted for the position of medical director of a new MEG clinical research center, and that was in 1989. The technology had advanced, and we had a seven-channel magnetometer and a shielded room to reduce no magnetic noise, and also we had the ability to record simultaneous EEG, which we continue to do, as you mentioned. So this is more a time of exploring possible clinical applications for MEG. We did study pre-surgical epilepsy patients, but we also studied auditory evoked responses in patients with schizophrenia and with headache, migraine, uh, and also looked at some basic, one of the researchers in the, in the uh, research group looked at fundamental cortical visual properties uh, in the visual cortex. And back to uh, epilepsy and, and such, we also localized normal functional brain regions for patients requiring tumor surgery 
uh, near exquisite cortical regions. That particular part was, was particularly interesting uh, and new to us there. Mm -hmm. And with the new things or the new developments comes the new set of challenges. Yes. So what was the main challenge that people were trying to overcome in the MEC field at that point in time? So the uh, main challenge, let me back up a second. So the seven channel magnetometer, seven sensors, was seven times more than a single channel magnetometer, which we think, wow. But we had to record two extrema, and these were some distance apart. And with a seven-channel magnetometer, we still could only record one of the two extrema at a time. So we weren't getting both all of the magnetic field recorded at the same time. This still required us to uh, spend a bit of time recording. It was less than two weeks. It was down to about two or three days. So we still had to rely on a lot of the methodologies that we use for a single channel magnetometer. In MEG, what we were looking for was a greater coverage. So a lot of the researchers in MEG were looking for larger magnetometers, even in seven channels, something that maybe was 30 or 40 channels and could capture both extrema on one side of the head. And one particular researcher, Sam Williamson at NYU, extolled the potential benefits of a whole head magnetometer. Well, that would have been really, really expensive. And so we kind of went, wow. But eventually, over time, in fact, he was correct. And the larger sensor arrays of 30 to 40 sensors, and then finally whole head magnetometers were developed. And he was kind of a, a stimulus at the time to, to look forward that way. And how did the future of neurotechnologies look like at that point in time when you were thinking about the future? Well, you have to understand that MRI and CT scans were improving, but they were not exquisitely detailed. There was not yet any fMRI. And PET scan and SPECT, which I talked about, were available, but they produced kind of fuzzy pictures. People had the technologies of PET and SPECT. They couldn't quite figure out what's going to be the best clinical application for them. So it was very much a era of development of neurotechnologies where we had tools and we were trying that it's, we thought would be very useful, but we weren't quite sure yet how. And so we were um, exploring a lot what were the possible clinical applications. And how much has it changed from what we have today? Oh, anybody familiar with uh, MRI scans or fMRI, those advances in magnetic resonance imaging, which is applying a magnetic field, as opposed to listening to spontaneous magnetic fields, have advanced enormously. Although the time resolution, unfortunately, hasn't gotten much less than a second. As I said, a lot of interesting brain processes begin and end in less than a second. And of course, we have improvements in SPECT and PET scan and combining PET and MRI scans to show metabolisms. And all of these technologies have multiple clinical applications now. Uh, in addition, MEG uh, with a whole head magnetometer has progressed also. Okay. And can you share with us an interesting or funny story or anecdote from the early days of MEG <laughs> development that you witnessed? Yeah, well, I guess I have to go back to when I was in Dr. Sato's lab. So he eventually, uh, before I left there, got both a shielded room and a seven-channel magnetometer. But this was before that. We had a single-channel magnetometer and no shielded room. So every morning I had to, uh, the first thing I had to do was to actually tune the single channel magnetometer with an oscilloscope. And I checked the signal output quality and noise sources uh, that showed up uh, in, in the recording. And the magnetometer, you have to understand, a magnetometer without a shielded room is so sensitive that a spinning magnetic stirrer, such as used for mixing chemical solutions in a laboratory that was located a floor below and a, a room off to the side, I could pick up that signal with the magnetometer with no difficulty. And unfortunately, it was 
It, it's such a small item, but it was, was so sensitive to the magnetometer, it was much larger than the brain signals. So I had to call and uh, talk with the person down there, find out when they were going to finish mixing so I could schedule my patient. And it seemed that um, every week, some new laboratory had a new piece of equipment, and I had to figure out what it was and track down the noise source. So that was a kind of an activity. But then one morning, I turned on the single-channel magnetometer to tune it, and it was horrible. I couldn't get any signal whatsoever. I couldn't, there was no way I could even start tuning it. I was so depressed that I felt like I wanted to jump out of the window of uh, the fourth floor laboratory. So I went over to the window and looked down at the ground. Uh, unfortunately, down there, I saw there was a truck with a portable 15-foot <laughs> radio antenna, and it was broadcasting electromagnetic signals across the country. Fortunately, it was only there for one day. And fortunately for me, the window was locked. Uh, so I wasn't able to jump out the window. But uh, that was... Uh, that was kind of a, a momentous uh, moment for me in my in my work. But it also yeah. demonstrates the sensitivity of the instrument. I know that many laboratories prefer to build their MEG lab on the ground floor and isolate it from any other laboratories uh, as much as possible. Is this still the case? Oh, I think with the shielded rooms are, are very good. So you can you have to choose have to choose the side of the building away from the radio stations that are broadcasting if you're in a city. Sometimes actually being up high on a floor in a building uh, can be a help, we discovered, because you're away from cars. So uh, you don't want to build it over a parking lot, you know, underground parking lot and such. The initial ones before shielded rooms, like it, they were done in, in Europe were often located out on farms. So to go visit them, you had to walk through the farm fields, past the cows and the sheep and such to get out there. And that was the case even in Cleveland, Ohio. I visited one. They had it out on a, uh, a farm belonging to the university that reduces. <laughs> Those are very, very sensitive detectors. Yes. I've never uh, knew about that. That's that's very new information for me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rose. So as you were studying patients with epilepsy, can you discuss your work and also what you learned through this research that you've done? So um, one of the things that, that I learned was uh, how with a magnetometer uh, and with a particular uh, analysis program called Beamformer was just how fast signals travel through the brain by neuronal conduction. Now, of course, they're electromagnetic signals. So from one location, the signals get out of the brain at the speed of light. But we could detect a uh, source starting in one location of the brain, activating another location in the brain. And these occurred during the, the time span of the initial spike, which I had no really concept before. So that was very, very impressive. And it kind of led us to what other researchers in MEG were learning and were wondering about it. That is how do different regions in the brain interact with one another? I would have to say that was a, a really striking new understanding that I learned with MEG. Yeah. And what would not be possible today without the work you and your colleagues have done over the years? So I think that the MEG source localization has made us, first off, it's helped greatly in the epilepsy. Now it is a standardized part of our workup for uh, pre-surgical evaluation in epilepsy. It's also made us aware of different events happening in different parts of the brain simultaneously or at different times because we can localize those and some of this is also with EEG source localization that has developed and raised again, as I said, this question of how different brain regions interact. And that would be very difficult without the MEG source localization. You can do some of that in fMRI, as people who work in there would be able to tell you. But the time resolution in fMRI, it's a, a limitation for the kinds of conclusions that you can make. So the rapid time of uh, MEG 
traffic time resolution uh, of MEG and uh, EEG have uh, really helped us in that regard. Yeah. And as MEG technology was advancing, your work also was changing in a way. How have advancements in MEG technologies impacted your work and the field of neuroscience more broadly? As I mentioned, the magnetometer studies, the MEG studies, whole head MEG studies, I know an accepted fundamental part of our pre-surgical evaluation. It used to be that, that we gave the MEG results at the very end of the presentation. So everybody had all the other information available. Now it's one of the first three or four studies that we review. Uh, and I think that indicates the importance that the clinicians have, uh, not just the MEG or the clinicians in epilepsy uh, surgery uh, have uh, put on MEG. For neuroscience more broadly, I think MEG makes possible closer time examination of brain processes that are discovered by other technology modalities. So a lot of work has been done with fMRI to look at uh, events and the results that came out of psychology. And those events lay the groundwork, the fMRI findings then um, lay the groundwork to, for further exploration with techniques such as MEG and EEG with source localization uh, that uh, can give a finer time resolution to these uh, studies. Yes, and when you talked about this, I immediately started thinking about the beginning of our conversation when you said that you were talked out by other advisors to work with the neurophysiological techniques as it applies to psychology. So how would that advice look like now? What, what do you think? <laughs> well, now, <laughs> now it's, I think it's, it's accepted. And I think that most people going into these neurotechnologies, instead of having to face, uh, say, the, the crosswinds or the headwinds that it's not possible now, this is a reason to go definitely into these other neurotechnology or, for instance, to go into psychology so that you can use, or psychiatry, because you can use these technologies. So now it's become really the kind of the ultimate goal is to tie all of human behavior to the underlying processes that are, are occurring. And this has applications not just in people who are awake, but also it takes us to places like the intensive care unit where someone is unconscious and trying to understand using these technologies to see whether the person is going to recover from their head trauma, make predictions. So it has completely recast that whole question rather than being an impossible goal to achieve as to being the goal, the one goal to work towards. So I think it's had quite, a, uh, quite an impact over the years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned how the perception of MEG as a tool that can help evaluation for epilepsy surgery changed over time from being to discussed last during the surgical conference to being one of the first to be discussed. In terms of that, maybe you can tell us about any particular cases of patients that you have seen that had, have made a lasting impact on you and maybe a possible application of MEG in this field. So I think Early on, there was a, a very important patient in uh, my thinking and development. Uh, and that's when I was at Albuquerque. He had a patient, uh, it was a right-handed patient, and the patient presented with a benign tumor, which we could see on uh, MRI scan. And it was located in Wernicke's area, which is a language area in the left temporal lobe of the brain. And the patient had seizures also, in addition to the tumor, and they were resistant to medication. They were causing the patient to hear a buzzing sound in the ear, because that was the auditory cortex. And also, if the patient started to talk during this buzzing sound, the person would make language errors called phonemic paraphasias. 
which indicated that the seizure was interfering directly with the language. So the patient might benefit from surgery of the tumor, but we were very concerned that the surgery might destroy the patient's speech ability because it seemed to be located near this, this well-known Wernicke's speech area. At the time, we weren't able to localize language uh, with the technology, but we could do some localizations of tones, auditory tones, the so-called auditory tonotopic map. But it gives different tones at different frequencies, and they line up in a, in a sequence. And the intracranial location of this fundamental auditory region was well known in normal patients, its location. And it should have occurred also right where the seizure was. So we mapped that out and localized it, and it had been displaced anteriorly and rotated in its orientation. So this find, these two findings, suggested to us that this slowly growing benign tumor that was causing her seizures had also caused functional reorganization of the patient's left hemisphere auditory region, and we hoped also moved the language region. So uh, that gave us hope, and the patient then uh, got the go-ahead to undergo tumor resection or agreed to undergo tumor resection with this information. The surgery was done, the patient was awakened, awakened during the surgery uh, so the neurosurgeon could talk with the patient while uh, doing the resection. So it was done very carefully. And then and the tumor was removed. Uh, and after the recovery from the surgical procedure, the patient no longer had seizures. But in addition, the patient retained her normal language. So this patient's findings and results impressed upon me the importance of MEG pre-surgical mapping of nearby exquisite cortical functions, such as language. And so we do this with all of our patients undergoing tumor surgery or epilepsy surgery if they're close to exquisite areas. We try to map out these normal cortical functions in great detail, and the neurosurgeon is very careful in the resection to avoid those terms. So that was a, that was a very... Uh, um, striking example of the applicability of MEG. Yeah, thank you so much for pointing this out, our listeners. So not only we can use MEG for localization of elliptiform activity, but also for functional mapping to evaluate where those important areas of the brain that we don't want to remove during the surgery. Yes. Can you tell us about any current or past research project that you are particularly excited about and why? Oh, well, thank you, Milena. Um, so before I retired, I started using a what's called a beamformer analysis to examine an array of locations in the left and right hippocampi, those areas that I talked about that are deep in the brain. These areas are uh, in adults, but also sometimes in pediatric patients, are very prone to causing recurring seizures. Uh, and the problem is that one hippocampus or the other hippocampus may be affected, but they're very close together. So it's difficult with scalp EEG to tell which one might be causing the seizures. But uh, with this beamformer analysis, I looked at uh, just a couple of patients and I focused the beam former to look at the left hippocampus and the right hippocampus to see uh, where the spikes were occurring. And they were occurring in one and not in the other um, in most patients. Uh, and the reason this is very important is that you need to have at least one healthy hippocampus. Years ago, someone with epilepsy, they thought it was happening in one hippocampus uh, and they removed that and then they thought it was happening in the other and they removed that. And unfortunately for that patient, that patient totally lost the ability to develop any new short-term memories, any new memories. It had remembered everything before the surgery, nothing after that happened. Otherwise it was normal, but no memory. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful. We have to remove only one if it's starting in the hippocampi and we have to pick the affected one. We can't remove the healthy one. So that was helpful, but it was not very rigorous. So I left, but my successor, Dr. Jeffrey Tenney, uh, who took over the management of the clinical epilepsy MEG program 
at Cincinnati Children's. And his team of researchers there continued that work and studied it uh, much more scientifically and rigorously in 30 patients and found that using this technology, we were picking out a particular location deep in the brain to do the recording that uh, was able to do this. We had, this to me was very, very momentous because um, back in Dr. Sato's lab, uh, with the help of a, a physician, another physician, we had uh, uh, done some some uh, work with synthetic forces uh, to record uh, deep in the temporal lobe. But this was very helpful uh, to, to prove this. And so it was very kind of, very exciting to me to develop this technique that was done by Dr. Tenney. Yes, thank you so much. I hope we did not miss that question about the deep sources. Maybe we can address it right now as we are talking about that, because as I know, there is a lot of conversation about possibility to record from deep sources in MEG, whether we can do it or not. But I think you were able to demonstrate that it's possible. Can you tell our listeners about that? So first, the first question was, could MEG seep deep enough into the brain? Uh, this is basically very close to the middle of the brain but not exactly at the middle of the brain. We were recording patients back in 1980s, 1985, 86, 87, with subdural electrodes for pre-surgical evaluation. And these we put very close to the hippocampus with the help of a physicist who joined the lab through networking from uh, a, another colleague at NIH, uh, invited this uh, Eduardo Duclosaurus. He devised how to make a source, an electrical source that could be record for the subdural electrodes, but also be a source for the MET to try to localize. And we were able to localize that deep of the brain with an accuracy of about two to three millimeters. So uh, we knew that it could record, but there was a great deal of brain noise or the smaller amplitude spontaneous signals rather than the synthetic signal that we were using. So the question is, how do you get past all that noise? And a lot of people told us that was never going to be possible. But with this beamformer technique, uh, with a whole head magnetometer, you can focus the sensitivity of the magnetometer to a single location. And so this is what I started, uh, just kind of dabbled in, and which uh, Dr. Kenny and his researchers working with him pursued and examined. They would examine a block of locations, or like a grid, a 3D grid of locations in both hippocampi, and listen for spikes, and found them uh, epileptiform spikes on one side, but not on the other. So um, it's really fascinating. And for other people doing research, not necessarily epilepsy, this, I think, this, as you were saying, this is good news that MET can see so deeply into the brain. Yes, absolutely. But still there are challenges. So what are the main challenges scientists are trying to solve in the MEG field at the moment? Thank you for asking. I think there are two main challenges. Uh, one, of course, is to improve the hardware for recording MEG, which is so expensive. And the other is to develop analyses of the signals once recorded. And there's recent research developing new kinds of magnetometers different from the squid magnetometers I spoke of. These are called optically pumped uh, magnetometers. Now, the squid magnetometers are, are expensive to build because they're cryogenic. The sensors have to be kept close to absolute zero. They're not uh, able to, to work at room temperature. So you have to have all kinds of insulation, very, very expensive equipment. Helium is expensive also. But the optically pumped magnetometers that are coming out um, uh, seem particularly promising because they can work at room temperature. And as I'm reading about these, they remind me of all the possibilities that we experienced uh, in the new field of MEG back in 1983 with the squid magnetometers. And uh, for this program, I went onto the internet and just counted the number of clinical application articles and some technical uh, development articles with the OPM, as they're called, optically pumped magnetometers. And there were over 50 in just the last two years uh, for clinical applications. On the other hand, for the analysis of MEG results, I think research is progressing toward 
detecting simultaneous interactions between different brain regions. There's many terms for this, but one of these terms is called functional connectivity. And I think this will be important for us uh, to better understand human brain behavior in health and illness in the future. And uh, looking at all of the processes going on in the brain and seeing how they're interacting with one another. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Speaking about that, can you share with us any exciting new developments or direction that you see emerging in the field of MEG research? And how do you see it in 20, 50, or even 100 years from now? <laughs> Thank you. So I, I expect we'll continue to see progress in linking brain anatomy and physiology with human cognition and human experiences, such as the origin of human consciousness, as kind of I mentioned for the intensive care unit recordings that are uh, being uh, untaken to see what level of consciousness the patient who seems to be unconscious actually has. And these advances will both be in basic science and clinical applications, and I think both of these will be very stunning. And I think what we'll see uh, as the most momentous advances will be the clinical applications that help us cope with personal health and personal productivity uh, challenges. Sorry, yes, I see so many interesting things we, we still can talk about. Where do you think the field of neurotechnology is heading in general? So I think uh, in addition to the recordings with MEG, I think that Intracranial brain stimulation with electrodes is being explored and developed to, for instance, detect and interrupt seizures in epilepsy patients and to suppress tremors in Parkinson patients and other movement disorders. And in addition, uh, the new field of brain computer interfaces, BCI, an area in which you have done quite a bit of work yourself, will further develop with the purpose of facilitating consciously controlled movements in persons who, for instance, have lost an arm or leg to trauma or um, uh, have lost uh, the ability to speak uh, through nerve injury or, de or deterioration. I think this is a particular field, BCR, that will greatly increase importance over the next few years and in the future, distant future also. With all the experiences you had in the field of research and clinical practice, what was the most unexpected thing you learned? So I think that uh, something we referred to before, which was the impossibility of correlation between brain anatomy and physiology with human cognition, which was thought at, when I started to be an impractical goal and discouraged by everyone I talked with over the past 50 years, the progress that has been made on that has been absolutely astounding. So I think that that is, was hoped for, but the success, eventual success at this point in time was quite unexpected to me. It brought me to a question that when somebody says that it's impossible, yes, which happened to you a lot over your career, what is the thought process <laughs> that you are employing when you hear something like that? I had many times when I thought things were impossible at first. I referred earlier in this conversation to the concept of innovating solutions. So when I ran into things that were impossible. And today, when I run into things like, oh my gosh, this is impossible. I first try to understand the problem by reading as much as background as I can on the topic. Now, there wasn't very much on MET, but lots of other times there are topics either directly or closely associated, someone doing something close to what I'm doing. Uh, then I take my problem and I try to break it down into smaller tasks that each of which I may be able to solve more easily. And sometimes even after doing that, I have to stand back and instead of focusing only narrowly on the problem, I have to think more broadly of other approaches to solve the problem. Also, as I think that uh, as a recurrent theme, I request advice and help from others uh, through networking. I didn't talk about this too much, but one of the physicists who came, Eduardo Duclosaurus, came to us in Dr. Sato's lab through networking through another physicist that I worked with. Uh, he knew Dr. Dr. Duclosaurus, who had different experiences in physics and brought that 
and solve some very important questions that were holding up our progress in clinical research. So networking in that respect, listening to other people who may have a different perspective on the problem can be and have ability to reframe the question in a solvable manner can be very, very helpful. Yes, and this topic of networking comes up very often as we're talking with students and researchers. It is definitely a key component to keep in mind, especially when we're trying to solve things that are not possible at the moment. Yes, indeed. How would you encourage others to pursue similar paths in the field? There are a couple of avenues. One could go directly into MEG. But uh, currently, with the high expense of the current equipment, typically to do that with the squid magnetometers, you pretty much have to find a institution, academic university or hospital that already has a squid magnetometer. With the new optically pumped magnetometers coming out that are whole head, uh, not as many channels yet as the 275, uh, that's much less expensive. So uh, you'll have more flexibility there. So that's one can go into a few like I did to study the, the technology itself. Or at an institute that's recording MEG or high-density EEG with source localization, one could go into a related field. A lot of programs that are, for instance, for epilepsy are very interested in people that are working in psychology or language or evoke responses to bring their expertise in uh, and work on products and use the MEG equipment. So I think there are multiple pathways to work with these technologies. Uh, you don't have to be the person holding the instrument and doing the, the actual recording with the patient, but one could be the person designing the, designing the tasks that the patient or the clinical subject is asked to do. And I think there's a wealth of opportunities there. Yes, absolutely. Because I think when we're thinking about doing something uh, in the field of magnetoencephalography, we're imagining that we will be doing the actual recordings. I think right now this work becomes a work of professionals specifically trained in uh, this type of recordings, uh, uh, MEG techs who are studying how to do it, do it in a proper way. As far as I know, there is the whole certification for or MEG technologies. Maybe you can tell a couple of words about that because that might be also some direction that our listeners might go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, so, yes. So, so that's not my area of expertise, but uh, one of the uh, persons uh, in the laboratory working with Dr. Tani, Dr. Hisako Fujiwara, is very involved in that. She started out as an EEG tech, uh, sleep tech, uh, evoke response technologist, uh, and went on and got her master's and a PhD, and now is on the faculty at Cincinnati Children's and uh, assists Dr. Tenney. She has a lot of experience. So if one were to contact the MEG lab uh, at Cincinnati Children's, there is a contact phone number there for Dr. Fujiwara who could give a lot of current information about certification in MEG technology. It has some similarities to EEG, but a lot of what's required is very different than EEG because of the different kinds of noise sources you have to correct for and other things. Uh, I would consider that she's an expert in that particular field. Yes, I would love Dr. Fujiwara to join our podcast at some point. I don't know, but I, I will ask her to join. You already mentioned how you approach the problems that seem to be impossible. Maybe you can give an example of what in your career seemed impossible, but you were able to prove it was possible. And how did you do it? So the thing that the one of the things that was impossible, we talked a bit about it before, was these very deep recordings in the brain. I should tell you that very good engineers at the, at the time that we were conceiving this, we had a single channel magnetometer, and we were quite proud that we had been able to record this synthetic signal with such great accuracy of just a couple of millimeters 
over the course of eight to 10 centimeters of depth within the brain and verify it uh, location. But we had a, a number of people in epilepsy who were very well-trained engineers and uh, did studies on the amount of noise in the brain. So all of the brain between the skull and these deep regions of the brain is active and making signals. And the signals that would come from these hippocampi, the, na the natural signals are very low amplitude in addition to being very, very far away. So it's a little bit like being at a cocktail party on one side of the room and on the far side of the room is somebody talking and you'd like to hear that conversation, but there's 30, 40, 50 people in between you can't possibly hear. So that was a goal. And I really thought it was impossible based on the discussion from the engineers to do this. But um, fortunately, with a whole head magnetometer, we got access to the a way of using the large number of sensors. One sensor couldn't do this, but a large number of sensors, a little bit like the large array in uh, southern New Mexico that listens to far away planets, all like in the movie Contact with um, Jodie Foster. That's basically the way we use the 275 channels, but rather than looking out into space, outer space, we're looking into inner space in the brain. We look at the combination of the signals and we, using that, we know just where each magnetometer is sensitive within the brain because it's directional. And so we can use the combination of sensors to focus on a small region of the brain and disregard all the intervening noises. So it'd be like standing in the cocktail party with a, an antenna and listening to the person on the far side. So that was, that was really marvelous. It, it took a lot of persistence and patience to develop the technique and working with the people who developed the beamformer analysis to understand how to use it. And then it took a lot of patience, I think, on Dr. Tannies and his fellows in the lab working with, with, with patients to verify that, in fact, this technology was listening to the hippocampus and, in fact, that it did have clinical applications that are going to be very important in pediatric epilepsy, but also, I think, very important in adult epilepsy because temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal by hippocampal involvement is a very frequent cause of seizures in adults. So that was something that I wanted to do, thought it was impossible, but with patience and perseverance and developing technologies over time became possible to us. So for me, that's astounding that art and science have progressed so much over time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rose. And can you provide a little bit more of explanation of what is superficial versus deep source? How many centimeters are we talking about so that our listeners won't understand? How many centimeters we're talking about? Uh, yes, 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 superficial versus deep. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so the, the brain, of course, it fits up tight against the skull. So that's probably uh, one or two centimeters, the, the cortex is closest to the skull. But the brain, if you look at a model of the brain, it has many foldings, but it, it's also folded all together, and the front is the side. So so we, we look at the outer surface, but there there's two hemispheres. So there's all the brain in the between the two hemispheres, and there's the base of the brain. So that's probably 10 to 14 centimeters towards the where the hippocampi are. You know, if you compare it to your hand, it's not very deep, but for an area that you're trying to listen to through all of the intervening brain activity, that's very deep and very far away, like almost a universe away, one might think. We were actually quite excited and quite happy to be able to do those recordings. So there, Dr. Tenney has also made recordings from the thalamus in case anybody is interested um, and looked at the thalamus's role in petty mal epilepsy versus the cortical, more superficial regions. And the thalamus is also a deep source, of, uh, it's a uh, switchboard, as it were, uh, deep within the brain. So hopefully that, that's uh, an explanation of deep versus superficial sources. Yes, yes, that's an excellent explanation. And I think what makes the problem even more complex is the property of the magnetic signal to attenuate with the distance mm. to the sensor. So that adds an additional component that needs to be solved, yes, for the deep sources. Right. 
But now, generally, we think of electromagnetic sources dropping off as the square of the distance. But because of the nature of the kinds of sources that we have in MEG, it actually, within the brain, and deep within the brain, it's dropping off as the cube of, of the distance. So that really puts it far away in a sense. So it's really dependent on the development of the new hardware and the new technologies to be able to see or listen, as it were, at, uh, at these very great depths within the brain. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our podcast. <laughs> Dr. Rose, what would be one main career advice you can give to our listeners? Someone once told me, uh, before I went into the medical field at all, that it doesn't matter so much what line of work or research you choose, as long as you try to be the very best in what you do. And that advice has been very very helpful to me. It's allowed me to be very flexible in what I chose to do, but it also has encouraged me to see what the best quality work that is being done currently, try to understand it and try to be at least that good. And then if I can get to be at least that good, to try to be a little bit better and to make that available to others as guidance. Yeah, that's an excellent advice. Can you share where our listeners can learn more about your work and how they can get in touch with you? My research interests uh, have shifted somewhat away from MEG now that I am retired. I'm not doing active recordings, and that was really driving a lot of my research. But there is a website to obtain email addresses to contact the people that are currently working in MEG at Cincinnati Children's in the MEG Center. I'll read that now, but perhaps you can provide that along with the podcast. It's a little bit long, but it's www.cincinnati children's. That's all. There's no apostrophe. It's Cincinnati children's, one word, dot org, a backslash research, backslash course, that's C O R E S, backslash Meg, M E G, backslash members, M E M B E R S. And that should take you directly to the the website for the MEG lab there. And there's contact information for Dr. Tenney and uh, Dr. Bujuara. There's a new researcher there also, Dr. Uh, Kremer, but her email contact hasn't been updated yet on uh, there and they're working. And then uh, they could probably tell you other people in related fields, such as psychology or psychiatry, that are collaborating with the MEG Center now if a person has a particular interest. Yes, thank you so much. We will add this information into our podcast notes. Indeed, there are so many people interested in working with the MEG, with MEG, and people at Cincinnati Children's are always open to collaboration as I remember them when I work there. So it's a beautiful place. Is there anything else, Dr. Rose, you would like to share with our listeners because, before we wrap up this podcast? Um, yes. Good fortune to each of you in your endeavors who are listening. I wish you the very, very best. Then I would like to say, even if you think you may have encountered a brick wall in your research, step back for a moment to reassess. There may be some way around the barrier or there may be someone who can help you with new insights. And if you're listening, thank you so very much for taking the time to listen to this podcast about uh, some of the early work done in MEG and, and looking forward to the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. That was absolutely amazing. A podcast, so much information that we don't have really much access to, to the things that were going and how it was developing and how it was impossible and how it became possible with the pioneers <laughs> in the field like you. So thank oh. you so much. Thank you for so much for inviting me, Mayena. <laughs>